From awaytogarden.com and robinhoodradio.com, this is Away to Garden with Margaret Roach, your weekly invitation to dig in and grow. A new book I'm reading emphasizes the word watching in the expression bird watching, as in Don't be in such a hurry to merely note that you've seen a bird, but instead really have a close look at what it's doing and discover the facts of its life. The book is called Slow Birding, and its author is here today to talk about how to become a slow birder and also about some of the species she profiles in the book. So more in a moment, but first, this message. Underwriting support from Color Blends, supplying top quality spring blooming Dutch flower bulbs to landscape professionals and ambitious home gardeners. More information on the web, colorblends.com. Today's guest is Joan Strassman, a specialist in animal behavior who's a professor of biology at Washington University in St. Louis. She's also now the author of Slow Birding The Art and Science of Enjoying the Birds in Your Own Backyard. Welcome, Joan. Thanks for making time to talk about this. Thank you. I'm uh, delighted to do so. Good. And uh, I should mention before we get started that we'll have a book giveaway with the transcript of the show over on awaytogarden.com and and say congratulations because I started reading the book and all I could think was finally an official title for the way I watch birds. (laughs) So thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. (laughs) Yeah. So so tell us what slow birding is. Give us the sort of uh, elevator pitch on what slow birding I guess I've been a slow birder all my life. I've uh, taught uh, some very focused bird classes where I've had students watch birds. And kind of the minute I heard about the slow food movement, I thought, oh, we should have slow birding. And it should be just the same, where we watch things, we appreciate them, and we don't just run around in a frantic way with our lives moving from one thing to the other. So I've wanted to write this book for about 20 years and I finally did it. So it's not (laughs) that kind of almost drive by birding where if you're into birds, you can like, you see an alert on one of the chats or the whatever, the the message boards, whatever you hear from a neighbor or someone, someone else that, oh, this was seen in such and such park or whatever. And you go and you like want to check it off your list. It's not that type of listing motivation. It's really watching, right? Yeah, it's it's watching. And then um, the reason I wrote a whole book about it, not just something short, is that I wanted to tell the stories of the commonest birds because they've the commonest birds are also the most studied birds. And the ornithologists have figured out some pretty amazing stories about them. So I also wanted to tell the stories of both the scientists and the common birds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, and so it's not just your experiences in slow birding with these 16 species you include in the book, but you've, you've introduced us to the people who have studied them perhaps the most and their insights and their experiences. And, and so it's kind of, it's deep that way. I mean, it, get, it goes really deep. Plus you give us, after you do each sort of species um, chapter, you give us like tips on how to get to know that bird better, like sort of little exercises to do, which is also good because it's a reminder that we can engage and study them ourselves, I think. Um, yeah, I, I did that because sometimes you know, you can tell people, okay, sit there and watch a blue jay for an hour. <laughs> and if, 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 if you don't have any idea what you might be looking for, it just, you know, it, it can be, it still can be very poetic and rewarding, but um, I always like to have something to count and, right. uh, you know, something to draw and something to count. And so, yeah, I just thought I would, uh, suggest some fun little things that you might do in your chair with your little notebook. Yeah. uh, Watching the birds. Yeah. And so you also give some sort of prescriptive in the, in the sort of initial chapter of the book, you give some prescriptive overall steps. And I want to talk about some of those closer to the end about, you know, how we can enhance, because this is about birding at home or in a, in a space that's familiar to us. And one, but I want to mention one now, which is, that we should create a home bird list. Um, and I, I wonder if you could just tell us why. Um, so in other words, not like a giant life list if we're running all over the place hoping to see rare birds, but a home bird list, yes? 
nice to know what is right around you, what you can expect here when the first, uh, I'm waiting for the first uh, juncos to appear. Yes. The uh, white-throated sparrows have already shown up. Um, so another nice thing these days about doing a yard list or a you know five-mile circle or a list for a certain neighborhood park is just do it in eBird. And then you can look back through all your lists in eBird. You can sum them up. You can... You don't really have to do any of the management stuff because eBird does that for us. So once you pick a place in eBird, you can look back at that place as in as many ways as you want to. So if you're interested in the turnover of the seasons, which I think we all are, seeing what birds you saw when, yes, is, is it's just I don't know. It's it's enriching. To yes. Me. And I keep, a, I keep a, besides my home list, and actually my list in eBird, and that's eBird.org. That, um, it's a kind of an online uh, database from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology that we can use and be citizen scientists and, you know, submit our data, but also have a record of what we've seen, as you were just saying. And I think I have only like, I don't know, 86 species in there. And 81 of them were at my or in my gar were in my garden. You know, it's it, that's how local my like I I've seen other birds elsewhere in other countries and what, but that's not what I'm doing there. I want to really do what you're advocating that we all do, and I, I'm, I that's why I said I was so happy to see it sort of named something and and um, because you know I feel like I know them and I have this winter list. I know who's here in the winter that I I kind of keep it that way as well. Um, I know who to expect at the cusps of the season, as you're saying. So, so, um, so you know, these are not rare birds that you're profiling, and these are the most familiar birds, really. And so, I wanted to just kind of dig into some of them. And um, the blue jay, everybody knows who a blue jay is. And so, maybe a couple of the things that uh, you talked about with the blue jays, their relationships with, I mean, they really helped shape the flora of parts of North America, didn't they? As far as we can tell, they were important in bringing the oak trees north. I mean, if you look at how quickly oaks moved north as the glaciers receded only about 10,000 years ago, they certainly didn't do it on their own. And uh, <laughs> blue, jays, <clears throat> blue jays are our best uh, current possibility. Some people think that the passenger pigeons were very important in that also. And that is sadly not a theory that we can test. Right. So blue jays um, uh, grabbing the acorns and moving them a mile away or a half a mile away and that continuing um, uh, movement that aiding the, dis the distribution of the, the acorns to plant more oaks. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so you can watch that. You can watch a blue jay with an acorn. Yes. You, you can see that they take the caps off before they move. You can stop under an oak tree and see if the acorns still left there are the lighter ones that have weevil holes that the blue jays won't have been interested in. So the tie of the blue jays to the acorns makes them a, an especially good bird for a, for a slow birder. Yeah. Um, with some of the tips about about blue jays and about kind of getting to know them better uh, they have so many different vocalizations it, it seems like they they're they're talky <laughs> um and you suggest that we sort of you know learn more about uh some of their sounds and maybe even record them and so forth um yeah they're yeah. they're they can fool there's another app from uh Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and these are all free, by the way. It's called Merlin, yes. and it will it'll listen to the birds that you have in your when you have it turned on. It'll listen to the birds, and blue jays can fool Merlin when they make the uh, the red tailed hawk sound. They fool Margaret too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I always look out the window. I'm like, who's here? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a good one. That's a um, 
uh, but but you know such a familiar bird and you profile the robin as well you talk about the robin and I mean that's a bird that in so many parts of the country we we all know and um, and we've we even know you know we could sort of close our eyes and think even people who aren't birders could close our eyes and think oh it runs a few steps and then it sort of cocks its head to one side as if maybe it saw something or heard something and then it goes for it you know it starts it starts pecking at the soil and that worm is is unearthed and so what's what's that about that was a fascinating tale because is it that they're hearing or is it that they're seeing what's going on um, so it turns out it is that they're hearing, and this is work by uh, Bob Montgomery and Pat Weatherhead, who uh, had heard heard that, I guess they had read a paper that said it was about vibrations, and they were wondering if that were true or not. So mm. they devised a they devised a set of very nice little experiments to see what exactly it was that. Uh, brought the robin so efficiently onto the worms. Right. Um, but, it, and so we think, we infer, oh, robins, they eat worms, but is that really their primary diet? They're only eating worms when they're feeding babies in, in large part. Robins are among the birds that eat the most fruit. I think mm -hmm. they're only surpassed by cedar waxwings. Yes. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's funny. So they kind of, I don't know what the word is, but they kind of pre-digest and then regurgitate the, the worms for the babies. Is that what the, wor the worms are like, baby food? Yeah. Usually when birds are eating insects or arthropods or worms and all those sorts of things, it's for the babies and they, mm -hmm. they don't really digest them. They just kind of smush them up into their crops so they can carry a bunch of them to their starving babies. Right. And, and the other thing that I found was interesting is you, you sort of challenge us, you say, try to learn to tell the males apart from the females. With, with, with robins, it's not quite so obvious as with some birds, as with, you know, a pair of warblers or something. It's, 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 it's a little trickier. And how, how do you suggest we learn to do that? So, yeah, this is something I really hadn't hadn't. I just thought you couldn't tell robins apart. But right. if you if if you look at them carefully, particularly in the breeding season, you'll see that the male has a much blacker head than the female, and a much redder or russet colored belly. He has mm -hmm. much stronger colors than she does, and they're often in pairs. They they nest together and both parents take care of the babies. So, so they provide you with a way of comparing because you can often see both partners together. Right. Right. Because I, I didn't, I never really thought about it. I like what you just said. I just thought, oh, I can't tell them apart. I, I you know, they're, they're too similar. Um, so you just mentioned cedar wax wings and speaking of birds who like some fruit. <laughs> Um, yeah. they're, they're, how in the world do they figure out exactly just before everything's ripe, they swoop in and, and you, I think in the book, you say cedar wax wings arrive unpredictably from on high. Um, it's like, they surprise me a lot in the garden. So, so tell us a little bit about cedar wax wings. So cedar waxwings are true fruit specialists. They, they, they love fruit. They eat fruit. Even the babies get only about three days of mostly insects. So oh. cowbirds, I mean, they, they continue, but even the little ones can get in fruit from very early so that cowbirds often lay their eggs in cedar waxwing nests, but then the cowbird chicks die because they just can't make it on that very fruit heavy diet. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. Um, you call them an improbable bird. I mean, they really are just, they're so beautiful. Um, the markings on them are so beautiful and there's, they have that little whistle kind of a sound. Um, right. And you know, a lot of people can, as they get older, they can no longer hear that sound, which is sad. Oh, 
It's too high pitched. Is that? Yeah, it's too Um, high. It's one of the first birds that uh, people with hearing loss or even just slight hearing loss lose. You know how the the teenagers have these uh, whistles that they can do on their phones that their teachers can't hear. Oh, (laughs) oh, my goodness. Inspired by a cedar. (laughs) That's pretty funny. Um, they, their name cedar waxwing. I mean, I have a big old Eastern red cedar or Juniperus virginiana in my front yard and they love that tree. Um, yeah. and yeah. that is that, that's where they, I think their common name, um, picks up from. Yeah. The right. Yeah. Cedar. yeah. Um, and they love, uh, shad amelanchier. Um, right. They do. Yeah. But how do they get, I mean, they, they really, they'll just home in on, uh, shrubs or trees with with fruit it, it's like the, they must have radar <laughs> well How so they they're know? so they're social in the feeding stage and they're just exploring all the time and when they find a fruit tree they don't have to hide that information because there's fruit for everyone it won't last that long so they they tell each other where where the where the fruit trees are it's I don't know if your city has one of those apps where you can find out where the fruit trees are in the city that you can go pick the fruit. It's kind of like that. Oh, Um, for for frugivorous or or fruit eating birds or whatever, I uh, I love Aurelia's uh, spikenards. And um, and so I have a number of different kinds, uh, mostly native ones in the garden. And at Aurelia fruit time, they, um, not just the wax wings, but also a bunch of different thrushes and so forth will come through and go crazy. And the one strategic error I made is I put a big stand of one of those plants near uh, my patio. (laughs) And it's kind of messy because fruit, the birds, um, it's like they eat it and it, it comes out the other side pretty quick. I mean, they really digest. I don't know if they even digested exactly what happens, but um, it's processed pretty fast, isn't it, the fruit? Yes, yes. There's actually been studies of that, of how long fruit takes to go to the through the gut versus yeah. uh, things like insects. It goes through very fast. Yes, it has to because it's not terribly tie in the carbohydrates, obviously, but uh, the birds do need protein and other things. So they just shoot that right through them. Yeah. Um, another bird that I that has dramatic patterning on its feathers, I think, is the northern flicker. And you include it in the book. It's a beautiful bird. Um, I, I, have saw, the, yeah. Yeah. I yeah. saw one this morning. Yeah. <laughs> and And so like the robins, when I see them, it's often on the ground, but they're looking for ants. Is that right? How in the world can it live on ants? So how does that work with the diet of the flicker? Isn't that amazing that such a big bird could uh, live on tiny little ants that you might see them picking out between the cracks in the pavement? Right, right. I I think that part of what that tells us is how little we see ants because ants are among the most... uh, abundant of all organisms and there's plenty of ant biomass to uh, support anybody. Now they're often underground and when they're underground, they're not accessible to flickers, but flickers know where they come up and the ants forage on the surface of the ground. So, so yeah, it's a, it's just one of those little um, windows into the, deep relationships that are right in front of us, but we don't see unless we're looking for them. Yeah. Um, they also, they're cavity nesters. They're, well, they're, they're woodpeckers. I guess what, they're our second largest woodpecker, I think. Um, but they're, so they're cavity nesters and they create the cavities that they live in. And how do they tell a good tree? I think you say in the book that aspens are a favored tree, for instance. How do they? Yes. Um, yeah, so they are they are a primary cavity nester. Uh, Karen Weeb has studied these the most in uh, British Columbia. And she says aspens are preferred. Aspens aren't particularly long live trees and they rot from the inside out, which I, I guess maybe that's not that uncommon. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, they, they 
find an aspen that's kind of at the exact right stage of, of rotting and build chisel in their nests. So a half dead tree or this, as you say, it has a hollow core. You're going to start excavating and you're going to then get a bigger cavity pretty quickly because of that hollow core that you're going to adjacent to, right? You're going right. To, right. I see. Or even, even if, yeah. Even even if it's not hollow, it could be, you know, rotting enough that the wood is soft. I see. I see. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, maybe. Yeah, that's that's. Um... And then you also say that they're faithful birds. Is that I do. They <laughs> are. And that may sound sort of obvious because birds look so happily paired up with each other. But in fact, most songbirds are not particularly faithful. Robins. Every nest has, almost every nest has chicks that are, that are not from, that are not fathered by the male that's taking care of them. But flickers, flickers are, are faithful. So interesting. It's, it's just, it, and that to me, again, I've watched them. They're common where I am and I'm in a rural area and a lot of uh, good, good um, hunting grounds for them, so to speak. And a lot of trees surrounded by forests. So lots of places for them to nest. And, you know, their voices and their appearance, I mean, it's just so common. And, and I knew about the ants, but I didn't know about their, um, pa- that they pair up like that. I didn't know that. Um, yeah, lots of birds pair up, but then they, uh, both the males and the females go hunting around for yeah. uh, other mating opportunities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Makes for great stories. <laughs> yeah. Um, one more bird I wanted to talk about a little bit uh, is is the cooper's hawk uh, and that's again another favorite bird a bird that i see a lot here and um and you people disparage this bird sometime if they see an encounter at a bird feeder where a cooper's hawk uh takes out a songbird um that and it all seems very cruel um to the observer perhaps but um you say their populations uh seem to be holding steady now, but they almost got done in by a couple of human factors over the years. Yes. Yes. I mean, they were, they were one of the birds that DDT nearly, nearly wiped out. And Bob Rosenfield's story of uh, how he became, began to study them. It's, it's just fantastic, you know, to be told to study a bird in a place you didn't think it existed. Uh, It's just, yeah, it's really uh, so he was he was where it was um, he he was uh, where where was where did he do the work? So he was a grad student in Wisconsin right. and was pl- planning to move to a school in Virginia, but his advisor, I think it was University of Wisconsin at Stevens Point, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that sounds right from the book. Yes. Mm-hmm. And he felt as an undergrad, he had taken all the classes, done everything he should have, and he was ready to move on to study to study the basic biology of Cooper's hawks, what they needed to uh, to thrive. And uh, at that time, he thought, oh, they're probably in the deepest forests and I'll never find them. So. He did something that we've actually done, which is in those little throwaway newspapers that used to land in all of our yards from local groups. Uh, he put ads in asking for Cooper's Hawk sightings. Oh. And to his surprise, he got lots of answers, but they weren't in the deepest, most pristine forests. <laughs> they were in the suburbs. Yeah. And there were plenty of them. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. They love a good bird feeder. <laughs> they do. That's a great target. Yes. Um, and uh, so, as I mentioned at the start of the book in the last uh, minute or two, I just wanted to talk about at the start of the book, you give us sort of some tips, some things to think about uh, to enhance the experience, especially in the home birding, like obviously put up a bird feeder. And I mentioned the other one to make a home, create a home bird list. But let's just maybe just outline a couple of the other of those tips to enhance our home um, environment for birding. 
well, most important, water. Birds love water. Yes. It's, I, yes. it's super important to them. We put, I have a little city lot. It's 50 feet wide. It's, mm-hmm. you know, it's very small. We still put a pond in the backyard. In the winter, one of the first things I do in the morning is boil a tea kettle of water and pour it on the little shallow area so the birds have some water. So water is good. Native vegetation is good. Any of the flowers that have lots of seeds, you know, the native flowers, we have lots of rudbeckia and black-eyed Susans and asters and stuff like that. And it's just so rewarding to see the goldfinches hanging upside down as they pull out the seeds. So yes. Yes. Even I, even a small city lot, you can you can uh, put some native plants and some water. Well, and I think the water can't be overestimated as it's it's it, how powerful it is. And as you say, 365 days a year, not just in the fair weather. So right. I could just talk to you forever about slow birding, and I appreciate your making the time today. And like I said at the beginning, we're going to have a book giveaway. Uh, of a new book, Slow Birding, uh, with the transcript of this show over on awaytogarden.com. And um, and I'm just having fun reading it. It's 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 a deep dive, but then again, there's these tips that are so just what we can do. Um, they're simpler too. There's lots of science and, and lots of inspiration. And so thank you so much. It's my pleasure to talk with you. Thank you. Underwriting support from Color Blends, supplying top quality spring blooming Dutch flower bulbs to landscape professionals and ambitious home gardeners. More information on the web, colorblends.com. And thanks to all of you for tuning in to Now Don't Miss an Episode. You can subscribe free to the podcast version of the show on Stitcher or Apple Podcasts or Spotify. And you can find me anytime at awaytogarden.com and on Facebook and on Instagram as at Away to Garden. And happy gardening and bird watching meantime. Away to Garden with Margaret Roach is a joint production of awaytogarden.com and the smallest NPR station in the nation, Robin Hood Radio.